There is no pledging. There is no initiation to become a member, but we can gain eternal membership into the kingdom of God. How do we become members? In this series of lessons, we look at the love of God and his plan, his mission in bridging the gap between us and him and bringing us back into a relationship with him. In his bridging the gap between us and him, he calls for us to become his disciples, members of his family, and he has commissioned us to make more disciples. How are we to carry out his commission? Review our past and present videos at sabbathschooldaily.com or visit my YouTube channel at Sabbath School by Dr. Brenda Ware Davis. You also may obtain the study guide for this series at sabbath.school or ssnet.org at no cost to you. God Most High, we submit ourselves to you. Give us membership into your eternal kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. The message of Jesus' disciples is called the eternal gospel. It promises us membership in God's eternal kingdom. It says that we through Jesus become a member of the family of God. In this kingdom, we will never die. We will live eternally with God. So in this sense, we have eternal membership in heaven. In Revelations 14, 6 and 7, we read about the first of three angels' messages. The first angel presents the good news that lasts forever. This angel presents the eternal gospel. Revelation 14, 6 says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. This is the only passage in the Bible where the word eternal and gospel are linked. We know what eternal means. It means forever or everlasting. But what does the word gospel mean? The gospel is good news. The everlasting gospel is everlasting good news because in it we are given a message about God's grace and mercy offered to save us from sin. This everlasting good news gets even better because in it we find that God offers this gift of pardon to everyone through Jesus Christ. John 1.14 tells us that Jesus came to this earth to show us God's grace, his loving favor and truth. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. The thing is, Jesus lived a life without sin. Though he never sinned, he died on the cross for our sins. He became our substitute. Although we deserve punishment for our sins, he accepted our punishment. This point is clearly made in Isaiah 53, 4 and 5 and 1 Peter 3, 18. Surely he has bore our grief and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And his, by his stripes, we are healed. Based on the conditions of the world, soon Jesus will fulfill his greatest promise. He will return to this earth. He will come back as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Then we are told that after a thousand years, Jesus will establish God's kingdom on this earth as expressed in the following scriptures. Acts 1.11, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Revelation 21, 1 through 4. 
Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth has passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. These promises are part of the everlasting good news. We are promised eternal membership in God's eternal kingdom. Let us not be deceived by any other news that may be proclaimed as good news. There's only one everlasting good news. There's only one gospel that can save us and it will never change. Ephesians 4.14 lets us know that false teachings will come and go. But the everlasting good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ does not change. Notice what it says in Deuteronomy 5.33 and Romans 2.6. You shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live and that it may be well with you, that you may prolong your days in the land which you shall possess, who will render to each one according to his deeds. In other words, God will reward those who believe his message of salvation and live it in obedience to his word. The commission given to his first disciples, he gives to us. When we choose to follow him, we become a disciple of Christ and a member of his eternal kingdom. We become members of a family of the family of God. Thus, we are called to make more disciples of Christ. And they too will help others prepare to see Jesus when he returns to this earth. True, honest disciples of Christ are fully devoted, loving people. But more than that, true disciples focus on all the biblical principles of discipleship, such as those mentioned in the following text, Luke 9, 23. Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Thus, the ultimate purpose of the true disciple of Christ is that of being prepared and preparing others for the second coming of their master, Jesus Christ. The gospel, the good news that continues forever in the first angel's message is an important part of God's work and judge of the whole earth. As disciples of Christ, we are to be working with him to save sinners so that they too can escape the corruptions of the world. How do we do this? Continue to segment five of this video, God's People, the Channel of Mission. Historically speaking, God has always had followers who showed his love to other people and faithfully represented his character. God's faithful followers obeyed him and accepted his plan for their lives. God continues to choose people today. God's people are those who accept the gift of mercy. They are those who accept his invitation to receive his grace. Moreover, all of God's people, both in the past and present, are instrumental in fulfilling his mission to save sinners. Genesis 12, 1 through 3 and Deuteronomy 7, 6, 11 and 12 in the Old Testament tells us what God's original purpose was for his people. Genesis 12, 1 through 3 says, Now the Lord 
had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curse you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God made a covenant with Abraham and his descendants. This covenant was a special agreement between God and Abraham and Abraham's future children. They were to be a part of God's plan to save sinners. God chose Abraham and his descendants, the Israelites, to be channels of blessings to all the surrounding nations. In other words, it was God's desire to bless Israel and through Israel to be a blessing to all those around them. Notice what it says in Deuteronomy 28.10. Then all the people of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they shall be afraid of you. So God chose Israel to be in a covenant relationship with him. But this relationship between God and Israel was conditional. The condition was faith and obedience. They were to have faith in God and obey him. The following scriptures provide more information on this relationship between God and Israel. Read Genesis 22, 16 through 18, Exodus 19, 5 and 6, Deuteronomy 28, 1 and 2, and 2 Chronicles 7, 14. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. The responsibility of Israel being channels of blessing for God also made the Israelites his witnesses. They were to be instruments of God's mission strategy in the Old Testament. It was God's desire that others, by observing the blessings of the Israelites obtained from God, would inspire them to serve him so that they could have access to these same blessings. God's mission strategy did not end in the Old Testament with the Israelites. In the New Testament, God's mission continues. Jesus adds a new dimension to God's saving plan. Read again Matthew 28, 18 through 20 and Acts 1, 8. Christ's disciples his followers make up his church. Different from the Israelites, Jesus commissioned his followers, his disciples, to go out to the world instead of waiting for the world to come to them. We must remember, however, that this mission did not originate with the church. God's mission, Jesus' mission, existed before the world was created. This mission remains. God has commissioned the church to help fulfill his mission. What is the church's mission? It is the same as he who called the Christian church into existence. It is the same work that Jesus does. It is as he says in Luke 19.10, for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Of course, no one in the church has the power to save anyone. But as a disciple of Christ, we are called and have been given the ability to lead others to the only one who can save them. That person is Jesus Christ. Mission is to the church is what air is to our lives. Without air, we die. Without a mission, the church dies. How big is God's plan to save us? To find out, continue to segment six of this video, The World the arena of mission. God's mission is not limited to one region, one nation, or one special group of people. Notice in Revelation 7, 9, and 10, how far reaching is the geographical scope of his mission. Revelation 7, 9 through 10 says, after these things, I looked and behold, a great multitude which no one could number of all nations, tribes, people, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, 
with palm branches in their hands and crying with a loud voice saying, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So God's kingdom will consist of, of people from all nations, tribes, people, and tongues. Matthew 28, 16 through 20 and Revelation 14, 6 and 7 have been our focus for this study. These verses help us understand God's plan, his mission to save humanity. They also help us to see that God has called us to become disciples of Christ. As disciples of Christ, he has commissioned us to proclaim the everlasting gospel, the eternal news, all about salvation through Jesus Christ. Thus, these verses, Matthew 28, 16 through 20, and Revelation 14, 6 and 7 tells us two important things. One, Jesus commissions us to make new disciples for him. And two, the everlasting gospel, the everlasting good news is an important part of God's mission, his plan to save us humans. Note that in his mission to save humanity, he does not force us to accept the everlasting gospel. He saves only those willing to become one with him through his son, Jesus Christ. We must accept what Jesus did when he gave his life as a sacrifice for our sins. He expects us to respond to his love by walking in obedience to his word. Both Matthew 28, 16 through 20 and Revelation 14, 6 and 7 have a common connection. They both address the where of God's mission. Matthew 28, 19 says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Both show that we are to share the gospel, the good news about the salvation of Jesus Christ with those who dwell on the earth to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. In other words, the good news about Jesus, the gospel of Jesus Christ is not limited to a special group of people. It is for all classes of people everywhere. God's plan, his mission for of the good news about Jesus is that it will bring together all people and unite us into one eternal brotherhood. Jesus is our model. When we accept him and his teachings, he will empty our hearts of hate, dislike, pride, jealousy, and all other bad feelings that separate us from each other. When we accept the truth as it is in Jesus, national prejudices and jealousies are broken down and the spirit of truth blends our hearts into one. We become united in Christ Jesus. With our hearts blended together in Christ and love, we adhere to Jesus' commission as spoken in Acts 1.8. You will be my witnesses. Jesus wants us to be his witnesses, but where? He gives us the answer in Acts 1.8. There we find three areas of mission. Area one, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Acts 1.8. At this time, Jesus' followers was near Jerusalem. So Jesus wanted them to start by sharing their experiences with the people closest to them. God's mission to save others starts in our homes with our families, neighbors, and friends. Area two, he continues in Acts 1-8 in all Judea and Samaria. We must reach out to those who are like us and close to us. They may speak the same language that we speak, and they may share a similar culture, but are lacking in the knowledge of God and his word. This group of people includes those in our own towns, cities, our countries. Area three. He then says in Acts 1.8, and to the end of the earth. This says that God's mission for us to share the everlasting gospel of Jesus is intended for us to reach all individuals from all places, nations, people groups, languages, and ethnicities. Thus, in our union of brotherhood, our ultimate mission is to share the eternal gospel of Jesus Christ with everyone. So here's your mission challenge for this week. 
challenge number one. Pray every day this week for your community, your circle of influence. God placed you there for a reason. Seek to determine the reason. For those up for an even greater challenge, challenge number two, research the demographics of your area. What kind of people live around you, ethnic and religious background, old, young, poor, wealthy, language spoken, and so on. Ask God to show you how you may be a channel of his love to them. Share your comments in the comment section below. Thank you for watching this video. To be notified when my next video comes out, subscribe to my YouTube channel, Sabbath School by Dr. Brenda Ware Davis. If you enjoyed this video and you want to use it to help in fulfilling God's mission, click like and then share. Thank you for liking, sharing, and subscribing.